So what are we going to cover this morning? Overview and concepts. Unfortunately, origin labelling has become more complicated. That's the reality of this new law. And to understand what you need to do, there is a number of basic concepts you need to understand to get across what you need to label. We will then look at the new labelling. There are options for some products. Uh, practical compliance, how do you actually go about implementing this labelling in the time you have left? So let's start off with an overview of labelling. Country of origin labelling does not sit in isolation to everything else you've got to have on your labels. So there are 11 things, yeah, that need to be on most food labels. Name of the food. Um, what's the name of food of a mass bar? Anyone? Confectionery. Confectionery? Close, yeah, yeah. Confectionery would work. Um, it's not Mars Bar, but Mars Bar is the trade name, right? So Mars, I think, actually goes a bit fancy. It's sort of like delicious nougat and creamy caramel wrapped in delicious chocolate is the name of their food. Um, confectionery would do just as well. Key thing is keep, by all means, have your brand name, but make sure you have the name or description of your food on there as well. That's the biggest trap. A certain well-known very well-known uh, beverage company was uh, actually got into a little bit of strife over this one because they used their brand name and sort of says, well, everyone knows it's a beverage. Well, no, but you have to state it, have the name of the food. Name and address of the person taking responsibility for the food. Just a reminder, that cannot be a PO box. That's generally an issue for smaller businesses who don't who may well be running their business from their residential address and they don't want their residential address passed across the great wide world, well, I'm sorry, it cannot be a PO box. It has to be a physical address that people can come and knock on the door. Date marking. Everyone know the difference between used by and best before, I hope? People are nodding. Good, good. Is it illegal to sell product past its used by date? Yes. Yes. Is it illegal to sell past its best before date? No. No, exactly. Key difference. Because of that, what do supermarkets prefer you to market as? Best before. Best before. What should you do in response? <laughs> you should push back. You should push back, right? This is actually a safety issue for consumers. So the fact that there might be a commercial disincentive to have a use by date rather than a best before is not an excuse. So push back on that if you get it. Lot identification. Can your lot I can your date mark be a lot ID? Uh, answer is yes. Right, can be. Provided it actually works as a lot ID. What's a lot? Sorry? A production run. Yeah. Production run, and of course that's largely self-defined, isn't it? You know, it's whatever you produce as a thing. So generally you've got a consistent set of ingredients for those that formulate foods from, from ingredients. So it's the one set of ingredients into the one process and the outcome of that is a batch. If you just produce one batch a day and your date marking is specific to the day, then yes, your date mark can be a lot ID. But don't think that a date mark is always a lot ID. They are separate concepts you must have a lot identification if you produce, for example, more than one lot in one day. Why do we have lot IDs? What's the, one of the biggest reasons we have for it? Traceability. 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 Thank you, guys. Yeah, absolutely. The ingredients list, the hard-working part of the label. Um, there's not too many issues come up with ingredients lists nowadays. Um, just a reminder, though, that we have a proposal out at, for ZAMS at the moment or what's called peel, plain English allergen labelling, that may affect how you declare allergens in your ingredients list. So watch this space on allergen declarations. Speaking of which, you must declare allergens either in the ingredients list or, in, or as well as in a separate statement. Allergens must be declared whether they are there as what? Ingredients, additives or processing aids. Okay, so things may need to be declared even if they aren't in the ingredients list because the ingredients list will not contain processing aids. So just be aware of that. Allergens and allergen traceability could be a whole other seminar, um, particularly here in WA. 
uh, as of course we now have lupins on our list. Lupins are a mandatory uh, declaration for when they are present as an ingredient of additive or processing aid. And one of the big issues is people are, what's the word, they're worrying that because now allergens is on the list, what you do about precautionary labelling that may contains? And a lot of people are saying, well, we don't know. We actually haven't got any processes in place to test for or deal with lupins. So what are we going to do? Put may contain lupin on everything? Well, hopefully not. That's not the idea of precautionary labelling. Um, without sort of being too blunt about it, have a look at your food production history. See whether you've had any lupin reactions in the past 20 years. If the answer to that is no, I would probably suggest you don't have any lupins to declare as may contain. But uh, allergens is uh, an ongoing issue. Uh, the other thing I might mention very quickly, in, in just in terms of an overview about um, where food reg's going, there is a national program being run by Allergy and Anaphylaxis Australia called the National Allergen Strategy. And part of that is looking at implementing mandatory notification to health, uh, health departments of hospital admissions for anaphylaxis. Personally, I think this is a great idea. Right? We don't really have solid statistics for anaphylaxis admissions in this country, and we can get a much better handle on how effective not just our mandatory labelling but also our voluntary labelling for allergens is if we had access to that sort of data. Characterising ingredients, this is the percentage declarations. Again, people generally don't have uh, particular problems with this. Key thing is what's a characterising ingredient or component, something that is really highlighted in the name of your food. Right, they're the big ones. Name of the food, described on the food, pictures on your label, that's the sort of thing you're going to have to percentage declare. Uh, usage and storage instructions, again, this can be safety stuff, so, so pay attention to it. And, of course, nutrition information. Please, in your panels, do not put the letters AL after nutrition. It is a nutrition information, not a nutritional information. Information has no nutritional value whatsoever, says the grammar Nazi in me. Trade measurement. Haha, <laughs> my favourite subject. So something that could kill you, like allergen labelling, has four presentational requirements. Yeah? It's got to be what? In English, it's got to be legible, it's got to be prominent, it's got to be in colour contrast. That's for something that can continue, kill, kill you. Trade measurement, how many requirements? 16. Two mil separation from any other edge or graphic. Minimum size, orientation, front of pack. I actually had a, a company that had a, a, a soft drink can, it had a funky brand that was vertical up the can, but their trade measurement was horizontal on the bottom of the can, perfectly legible. Front of the can, no worries at all. But the requirement is that the trade measurement read in the same direction as the major brand marking. So they had to ditch all of their, their packaging and have it reprinted for a, a statement that was entirely legible. This is a major area of reform that the industry is looking at. So what's missing from that list, anyone? Country of origin labelling, yay. Okay, let's not spend too much time on the whys other than I need to get you across a couple of hurdles. Why do we have country of origin labelling? Particularly now, why do we have this reform? People will tell you that, well, country of origin is about consumer information, and indeed it is. Ultimately, it's about providing the consumer with information. Okay, so what are the big changes? The origin statement has a box, a logo and a bar chart, whereas previously it was just a text statement. There's now a claims hierarchy. You used to be able to choose between product of, made in, packed in. You can't anymore. Right? You are told the claim that you must make. Product of is more restricted. Right? Product of used to be all significant ingredients and virtually all processing. That was the old test. The new test is all Australian ingredients and, products and additives. Right? There's a lot of products currently make product of claims that will need to move to made in. Right? If you're in that boat, don't stress. Just make that change. Make that leap. 
right? You are not alone because almost everyone in your category is going to have to move. And there's a number of iconic foods out there in the market that currently make product claims that consumers are just going to have to deal with made in Australia claims for them. All right. uh, because Australia as a manufacturing nation imports a lot of our additives. So if you use an imported additive, you're suddenly not able to make product of it all. You're into made in. So the product of space is going to shrink, the made in space is going to grow. Made in has been redefined. Let me say that the definition, or the new definition, I think is better, right? It goes to essential character or nature, whereas the other one talked about appearance. Now, I'm sorry, if you take a blue fence and you paint it red, it's still a fence, right? You've changed its appearance, but you haven't changed its essential character. So the new test focuses much more on essential character. And I think that's probably a right thing to do in terms of better con consumer information. The other thing is the wording is now largely set. You used to have a, a requirement to provide a statement and that wording was up to you. Pretty much now you are given choices but the wording itself is prescribed and you must use it within the box at least. So they're the, they're the big ones. So let's look at some basic concepts. This is the new look. This is what the labels are going to look like. There's a logo, the bar chart, mandatory text, all in a box. We are. Not all claims will have all of these elements, but that's the basic look. The logo signifies manufacturing jobs. It's the made-in part. It, it means that we have people in Australia who are substantially transforming products here. They are employed in the manufacturing industry. The bar chart talks about Australian content. This is the farm bit. Right? The bar chart's about how much this product, so buying this product may support Australian farmers. Right? The text used to be free form, now it's pretty much prescribed. And it's in a box because this has got to stand out. This is important stuff. Okay, the concepts I want you to understand is the bar chart. What is a non-priority food? Whether you go for minimum versus average content two different uh, options, and what is a retail sale? Retail sale is probably not too different to what you think. Non-priority food may well be different to what you think. So let's have a look at those. The bar chart, basically it's a box, 20% tick mark, so a little tick mark at the bottom for 20, 40, 60 and 80. Right? You fill from the left, as the animation showed. You quantize down to 10% intervals. So if your product has 68% Australian content, you fill your bar chart to 60%. If your product has 18%, you bring it down to 10. If it has 11, you bring it down to 10. Right? There are extra tick marks, apart from the 10, 20, 30, 40, up to 90. There's an extra tick mark down the bottom at 5% for the very low content, and there's another extra tick mark at 95% for the very high. So if your product is actually mostly Australian, but you do happen to use an imported ingredient, you know, um, wine, where you use imported sulphur dioxide, right, then you are made in Australia from probably, what, 99% Australian ingredients, but what you show in your bar chart is 95. You fill it to the 95 tick mark. Okay. Getting this bar chart right is going to be relatively important in understanding where your labelling goes. Um, there is a slight modification to that which I will, will talk about in a couple of minutes because the text statement is different from the bar chart. Okay? But the bar chart shows 95% even though it's 99.99 or whatever. And the big change for that of course is you're no longer product off. You're made in because of that 0.005% additive. Yes. It is down to that level. If your additive is down at 0 0.005 or whatever, it is not 100, it is 99.995, and therefore you're in made in space, not product off. Okay, non priority foods. I was involved in lobbying it when all of this was going through with the Australian Food and Grocery Council. 
And we managed to convince the government that not every food needed to jump through all of these hoops, that there are a number of foods, particularly the, at the more highly manufactured end of the, the territory, the space, that uh, consumers didn't greatly care. They were more concerned about where it was made than where the ingredients came from. So this is the list. Seven things came out. And these are called non-priority foods. They still require origin labelling, but the requirements are much less. OK. Seasonings, confectionery, biscuits, sat foods, bottled water, soft drinks, sports drinks, tea, coffee, alcoholic beverages. Woohoo! All of the wine people are now going, thank goodness, I thought I was going to have to go do something odd. Well, you still do, um, but, but you're exempt from a lot of the, the big requirements. The trouble is, these things don't mean what you think they mean. There is a dictionary at the back of the information standard, the country of origin information standard, which is part of the Australian consumer law, actually has a dictionary at the end. So jam, for example, includes all of these things, but does not include marmalade. <laughs> right? So confectionery is, is exempt. But confectionery does not include jam. Jam does not include marmalade. So jam, marmalade is not part of the exclusion for jam. So is it a confectionery? No, because it's actually separately. The key thing is this is really quite bizarre. Did you know that the definition for confectionery, I should go back one if I can. I don't know if you can see number three there. Confectionery includes ice cream. This really shows how important it is to look at the dictionary, not at the words in the excluded list. Right? I was giving this talk in Melbourne, and it was at this point where a member of the audience put her head on the desk and burst into tears. Right? And that was a bit disconcerting for the speaker, because generally I like my audience to be engaged and smiling, not crying. Um, this was about four months into the... The, the transition period, and she had just done for nothing else for those four months but develop new country of origin labelling for all of her ice cream products. Because she looked at the non-priority list, ice cream wasn't on the, the, that list of seven things, so she said, we've got to do all of this, convince management to give her the time, and now she finds out that it's a non-priority food after all. Look up your definitions. Right? You can't just assume that those words on that list mean what you think they mean. OK, if you are a non-priority food, you do not need the logo, bar chart or box, but you still do need a statement. Right? If it's grown, produced or made in Australia, bear in mind how those words are now used. Right? So then you have a statement saying so. So if you have an uh, alcoholic beverage that you make in Australia with an imported additive, right, you do not need the logo, bar chart or box, but you still need a statement, and that statement largely must be made in Australia because it's not product of, because it contains imported ingredients or additives. If you, that's if you import the sulphur dioxide. If you do a biodynamic wine and it's just Australian grapes, that's fine, then you're product of. Okay? But this is the key thing for non-priority food. It doesn't exempt you from the requirements. It just basically gets you out of the logo, the bar chart, and the box. But that's not you, right? Sorry? That, that's your climate. Well, no. The, you, you currently do have to have an, an origin statement. But, of course, you had a lot more freedom. You could choose between um, product of, made in, or bottled in Australia. You don't now. You have to state one of these things. Right. Only if it is not grown, produced or made in Australia, but it, say it is packed in Australia, if it's from one country overseas, you state that country and optionally indicate that it's packed in Australia. So if you are bringing in, it's a non-priority food, so I'm trying to think of an example of, oh, let's, let's stick with ice cream, right? It's made in a country which I will call Anich, Anich which you can go backwards and try and work out what Anich backwards says. Um, but I suppose it's 
a fictional country called Anich, and I bring it in, I pack it in Australia. I have to say, made in Anich, and I can optionally state packed in Australia. Again, this is non-priority food, so it's not in a box, no logo. Right. Otherwise, if it's from multiple countries, right, you say packed in Australia from multiple countries. This idea of getting your foods from multiple countries is an interesting one to play with. It may mean the difference between declaring a country of origin or simply declaring a packed in Australia thing. So we'll come back to this a little bit more. Otherwise, simply state the country of origin. So if you have a beverage, for example, um, that is a coloured particular sort of bovine that is uh, made in Austria, canned in Austria, brought to Australia in its canned form, then that is simply labelled as made in Austria. And in fact, as a, um, <laughs> the dictionary up to the back does indeed say that um, uh, energy drinks are part of us in the same category as soft drinks. So <laughs> again, go to your dictionary. Uh, the exemption says uh, soft drinks and sports drinks, but energy drinks are actually included in that if you look up the dictionary. So that particular product is a non-priority food. doesn't need a logo, box or anything, just needs a simple statement made in Austria. Okay, minimum versus average content. The basic law is you declare in your bar chart, yeah, and in your text statement, you declare minimum Australian content. And the ACCC is quite clear on this. Minimum means minimum, not anything else, right? It is what you can guarantee is in your product, right? You ha in setting your minimum, you have to take into account seasonal, seasonal availability. You have to take into account foreseeable issues. We know North Queensland has cyclones. So if you have an interruption during a cyclone, that's not an excuse for failing to meet your minimum. Right? It really is quite a strict test. And the ACCC make no apologies for this as the enforcing body. They will say minimum is minimum. You didn't need to declare anything if you knew that there was a risk. So this does require... You know, it's not as easy as just slapping a label on. You need to think about what's the minimum Australian content I can guarantee, almost irrespective of what happens in supply. The alternative is average content, right? Let's have a look at the two. If I make a product that is available in Australia for nine months, three quarters of the year, and that comprises 75% of my food, the rest is imported, right? What do I declare? 75%? The only trouble is that that 75% is only available for nine months of the year. For the other three months of the year, products may be 100% imported. In that case, even though I've got 75% content for three quarters of the year, my average content, my minimum content is zero. Because there are three months of the year where I do not have Australian content. Right? Minimum is minimum. And don't be surprised if some of the minimums that come out on the packaging are quite low because it's what you can guarantee will always be there. Right? The question is, does that worry you? Right? If you are concerned that, hold on, my product has like three quarters Australian content for three quarters of the year, right? what's going on? I have to declare zero. No, if you want, you can declare average content, right? And you can work that out, right? It probably comes out close to like 60-something percent as an average content across the year. And you are allowed to declare average content. However, there is more bookkeeping if you want to make that choice, right? Minimum content, you just have to show that that's the minimum content. Average, you need a survey of the Australian content of your product over a continuous one, two, or three year period to show, to prove that the average is, an av is a true average. For a right. new product? Sorry? For a new product, you don't have that option then? No, you don't have it for new products, exactly. Yeah. Right. You, the minimum is, would be to have one year of data. Right. And what's more, it's a rolling process. Your time period that you've collected your data has to be more than two, no greater than two years from the date of packing. 
So your data expires, if you like. Your, the data you're using has a two-year expiry date, and you need to update it constantly as, as time goes on. Right? Um, so you are buying into a reasonably solid bookkeeping exercise by going down this path. You also need the, uh, to put in what the, the standard says is an identifying phrase, right, which basically is a number or a means for consumers to contact you to find out what the Australian content in this batch is, and you've got to be able to provide that. You don't have to have it on label, but you've got to have it available for inquiry. Content, it's a bit like ingredients list. The, you know, when you're looking at your bar chart, what do you count? Right? You count, it's by ingoing weight, not in product weight. Ingredients and additives, but not processing aids. It's like an ingredients list in that sense. Right? And if you have a compound ingredient like a muesli, it, you know, if you're producing a muesli bar and you're buying in the muesli ingredient, you have to deconstruct that. You have to find out from the muesli manufacturer how, what's the origin of the sultanas, what's the origin of the date pieces, what's the origin of the oats, what's the origin of the other cereals. Right? And break them all down by their percentage in the muesli and then the percentage of muesli in your food and that gives you the content. Right? So there's a fair exercise in knowing the origin of all of your ingredients, particularly if they are compound ingredients. You, you need a full breakdown of your compound ingredients to be able to work out your final percentage. Big information exercise. If you buy your ingredients from overseas, they may buy, you know, if you buy oats as a commodity, they could come from 40 different countries and they may all get blended together and you're just buying oats. So what do you do? What do you do? Right. You have to assume in cases of doubt, because it's minimum labelling, yeah? You don't go over, you can go under. Right? So if you don't know the origin of ingredients, count it as zero. Okay, uh, three rules for water. Reconstitution takes on the origin of the ingredient. So if I take concentrated orange juice from Anik and I dilute it with Australian water, that water magically becomes Anik water. Okay. Reconstitution, so a dehydrated or concentrated ingredient, the water used to rehydrate it, takes on the origin of the ingredient that you are rehydrating. Okay. I take Australian concentrate ship it to, I don't know, let's pick a country, China. It's diluted with water in China and packed and brought back to Australia. What's the Australian content? No. What's the Australian content? 100%. Are you kidding? I am not kidding you. Read it. Reconstitution takes on the origin of the ingredient. My Australian orange concentrate, I ship it to China. The fact that they're using added Chinese water the water takes on the origin of the ingredient, which is Australian, so the product becomes 100% Australian. I didn't write this stuff. Don't blame me. <laughs> right. What they had in mind was the other way, yeah? Concentrated juice from third countries coming to Australia being reconstituted here, and water being counted as Australian content, that's what they didn't want to happen. Take on the pack, they didn't have to say that it's packed in China? We'll come to packed in in a sec. Did anyone else? Yeah? So if you have an iced tea, you're using Australian water, but you're using Chinese tea? Okay. That's the, the question was what happens if you, uh, if you bring in Chinese tea and dilute it with Australian water? The answer is the Australian water becomes Chinese water. <laughs> You've got to love this stuff, don't you? Okay, so that's a special, one of the special rules for water. The other one... Okay, the other thing is, in calculating your content, you ignore liquid packaging mechanisms. This is mediums. This is something where you're packing the product in a liquid for sale, but the liquid is typically discarded prior to use. Okay? Your classic example would be your fruit. Now, who discards the fruit syrup when they use fruit? Who doesn't? Is the fruit syrup liquid packaging? Some do, some don't. Right? 
Tricky question because you, you only get one label. You don't get to label for different... Yeah. If you discard your liquid packaging meat, uh, fruit syrup, please read this label. If not, please read that. No. No. Well, the, who discards the oil from their sardines? Who doesn't? Right. If in doubt, it's probably best to not discard it. Right. If, if it's, you know, the, the question is whether it is typically discarded or not. If it's 50-50, that's not typically discarded. So in that case, it becomes an ingredient because the third category is you treat it as an ingredient. Yes, another Does question. Does it kind of come down to the name of your product? So if you say that this is sliced peaches, then it doesn't include the water content. But if you say it's sliced peaches in syrup, then it does? Okay, the question is, is, does it depend on the name of your food? If you have sliced peaches, is that different from sliced peaches in syrup? The answer is no. It depends on whether the medium is discarded or not typically by the consumer. Right, so um, yeah, smoked oysters in oil. Most people would actually discard the oil, right, and eat the smoked oysters. But it, it depends. What you will need, if you if you are excluding stuff as a liquid packaging medium, if you dis, if you're excluding that for your origin calculation, you will need to have evidence that it is typically discarded. Right, that's some sort of consumer survey evidence or something like that. Right, if you don't have that evidence, it's probably best to assume that it's not discarded. We have another question. Well, the question is whether the it's discarded in your marinated olive. So some of the oil, of course, soaks into the olive, and that's part of the food, right? But some of it gets discarded. You have to essentially divide up the oil content between what's kept and what's discarded. Another question. So if in doubt, just treat it as an ingredient. If in doubt, treated as an ingredient is a wise way to go, unless you hold evidence that it is typically discarded. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the question is, is the brine in feta cheese, I think that is typically discarded. And, and so that would be a liquid packaging me medium that you do not take into account. You can see how, you know, people rush in and say, what label do I need? It's actually more complicated than that, yeah? You need to get across these concepts about what, what is or is not counted. And I've done this again, haven't I? Try there. Retail sale is pretty much what you think, sale to consumers. It includes the sale of retail ready packs. Right? So the fact that you're, not, you're selling to a wholesaler, not a retailer, doesn't get you out of this if you're selling consumer packs. But it does exclude some things. And this interests me. Immediate consumption, restaurants, canteens, uh, stuff made and packaged on the premises for which it's sold, delivered at the express order of the consumer, so all of the fast food restaurants are out of it. Um, let me go back to that previous one. One thing that's not shown on that slide, restaurants, contents, prisons, hospitals. So apparently if you're sick or a criminal, you, you, part of your punishment as a criminal is you don't get country of origin information for your food. If you are not required to label it, there are still circumstances where you are required to provide the information to whom you supply your food. And those cases are where the food is to be on sale. So if I'm selling something and it's not a retail sale, but the person to whom I'm selling is going to on sell that food without processing it, I need to provide them with all of the origin information. Right? And when I'm selling an ingredient. If I'm selling, in the, that previous example, if I'm selling the muesli mix to a muesli bar manufacturer, I have a legal obligation to provide the menu, the, my customer with the origin information about my muesli mix. So this is to allow the information to flow through the chain. Of course, these obligations are under Australian law, so if you are importing stuff and you can say, you've got a legal obligation to provide it, that's say, do I? I'm over here in Malaysia blaming my muesli and I don't think I can need to provide it to you at all. Well. Australian law doesn't actually apply very much outside of the country, although the, a triple, the, sorry, the uh, Australian consumer law is an exception to that. It will claim to apply, but enforcing it could be a different matter. So there's a question here first. OK, the question is, if, if I have a muesli bar and the raisins in that muesli bar contain added sulphur dioxide um, from overseas, from overseas uh, the answer is that would stop you labelling your product product of. That would make your product made in. Because even though it's a small amount, the definition of product of is all Australian ingredients and processing aids. And if they are not all, 
including in compound ingredients, then that's not so product of Well, it, in some cases it is, in some cases it is not. The, one of the big issues on country of origin has actually come up with rennet in cheese about whether that's an ingredient or a processing aid. You have to be very careful and don't be surprised if you need to give a technical justification to the ACCC, who are not food experts, as to why you are claiming something is a processing aid rather than an additive. Right. So it's not quite as simple as saying, oh, it's a processing aid. You may need to have to prove that it's not serving any functional uh, effect um, in the final food. No, no, the, sorry, the question about information, it doesn't have to be provided in the box or, or anything like that. It is, it's simply a written piece of information. Okay, the question was about imported foods. How do we go about getting that information? What's, what sort of level is going to be acceptable? Um, ultimately, it depends on the nature of your food and how excited you are about origin labeling. Um, there are a number of foods which are not sold on the basis of their origin. They're sold on the basis of what they are. Um, they're sold on the, uh, rather than on country of origin, they're sold more on regionality or on production or a number of things. You need to work out what your, how invested you want to be in origin labeling, right? Because you always have the option of understating and under declaring. And if it's proving too hard to get the information out of a, overseas supplier and it's just not worth the candle, just treat it as zero. After all, it's about Australian content, you know, the bar chart, right? Um, remember, you can have zero Australian content and still be made in Australia if it's substantially transformed here. So you can get the logo even if the bar chart is empty. Okay, yeah, the, so it's, it's almost like a transitional question about what do I do with my label stock when I've ordered two years worth of label stock and you know, it's about to come in and I have to change my label with the new laws. Okay, we'll come to this under transition, but the long and short of it is the, the key date is 1 July 2018. Right? What's that? Two and a half months away. Right. And it's all to do with when you pack product. Stuff that is packed prior to that date, 1 July 2018, can have the old label and can be sold forevermore with that old label. Anything that is packed after that date must carry the new label. Small packages, same definition as the Food Science Code, 100 square centimetres, requires the words and a box. You just get to admit, omit the logo and the bar chart for small packages. Key thing to remember, and uh, you know, this is not just for this exemption, this is generally, it's the surface area of the pack not the label area of the pack. Okay? The label area of that pack is a lot less than the surface area of those little source packs. Now, it's not an issue because they're actually still under 100 square centimetres, but bear that one in mind. It is the surface area of your package, not the label area that counts. Okay? But if you are, have a surface area less than 100 square centimetres, you have a box and you have the text statement, but you do not require anything else. There are no legibility requirements uh, per se. There are outcome requirements that it must be in English. Um, it must not have anything contradicting it in other languages. It must be legible, prominent, and in colour contrast. These are the standard food standards code requirements for any mandatory statement, so this is not especially new. The good news, there is no minimum size for this. It must be legible, and please, those of us who are getting old and you know, carry around reading glasses, we do like labels that are more readable, please, particularly in dodgy supermarket lighting, but there is no minimum size per se. Commencement date, we've talked about 1 July. That's your compliance date. There is um, the, the question that was asked before about uh, selling stuff past that date. Uh, it's called unlimited stock in trade and it was something that the food industry fought very hard for and achieved in all of this. So the key date is when you apply your, your pack, when you pack your food, right? Anything that's packed before 1 July can have old labelling. Anything packed after 1 July has to have the new labelling. The fact that it was sold after 1 July doesn't matter. So if you've got stuff in your warehouse already 
that is packed well before 1 July, but is not going to be sold for another six months, you don't have to sweat it. What you will need is evidence that you packed it before 1 July. So keep those manufacturing records, like you wouldn't anyway, but keep them so that you can prove that batch number 1234 was manufactured in April 2018 and uh, therefore doesn't need to comply. Keep your manufacturing records very carefully. Question? Just on the... Can, the question was, can you use stickers? The answer to that is yes, provided the sticker, of course, carries it. Well, it doesn't even so much have to cover up the existing one because hopefully they're not in conflict. But So yes, you can use stickers, but make sure the sticker doesn't cover up any other mandatory information when you do it. That's one of the big problems of just getting sort of random stickering happening. It needs to be quite a deliberate exercise. Find, find a spare bit of package space and stick it there. <laughs> yeah. Um, for those in the regions, the poor guy just raised his eyebrows like, spare space on my label where, package? Where am I going to find that? <laughs> What's this worth to you? The Australian Consumer Law, Section 203, provides a financial penalty for non-compliance. $1.1 million. This is a lot more than you are used to in food standards regulation. You get this wrong, $1.1 million per offence. So if you have five products and you got them wrong, $5.5 million. It can ramp up very quickly. The offences apply to selling, offering for sale, or having in, perfect, having in possession for sale, or manufacturing. So it's quite broad offences. Um, this does not apply to export food. So if you're exporting your product, you do not need to have this labelling, right? But it's a good idea. There's actually a provision in the consumer law that says if the goods are marked as being for export only, there is a presumption that that is the case. It's um, export to New Zealand. It's export only. I've got right. Export to New Zealand is still export, correct. <coughs> OK. Those of you who are worried about the 50% cost rule, remember to make a maiden claim at the moment the, to get the safe harbour. I won't go into the details of it. You've got to have 50% of your costs are incurred in Australia, processing, oh, sorry, labour, overheads and ingredients. That's all going. So that whole accounting exercise around origin claims is disappearing. That's a good thing. The ACL includes a safe harbour for uh, compliance with all of these rules. What that means is you will never be said to be false or misleading if you comply with the information standard. Okay? You are given a get out of jail free card. This is really important because the ACCC has previously said for averaging claims that the data that you provide as an average claim must reflect the, uh, be indicative of the percentage that's in the food that's sold. Whereas this law specifically says if you have a a one-year continuous bit of data that's no more than two years old, you can use that even if what's in your current product bears no relationship to that data. The ACCC has previously said that would be false or misleading. The standard now specifically allows it, and what's more, says that it is not misleading to use that data in that way. So this is the good news. If you follow these standards, you won't be false or misleading. And of course, origin labelling is disappearing out of the Food Standards Code. So you won't find it in the Food Standards Code as from 1 July this year. And of course, we've talked about this earlier, the definition of substantial transformation has been changed. So again, it's a top-down hierarchy, and this is a change. You used to be able, if you weren't concerned about making origin claims, you could just say, bottled in Australia from imported ingredients. And that was all you needed. Not anymore. There is a hierarchy and you must follow the hierarchy of claims. Alrighty, we're done with questions as we go through. Just a couple of minutes, yeah? Okay, the question was if you have done some consumer surveys of your product and you find, for example, that they're not that interested in origin labelling and therefore to make sure I'm on the right side I'm going to massively under-declare the Australian content, is that wrong? No, that's not wrong. Minimum content is, can be underdeclared, and the ACCC have said this, that they are interested in over-declarations, not under-declarations. Uh, the question is, you know, with, if I do my due diligence and I decide that I really am not interested in this, could I go, for example, with Made in Australia from 0% Australian ingredients? Right? The answer is yes. If you're substantially transforming here, and if, if really what you found is consumers are more interested about that it's made here than where the ingredients come from, then that's an entirely legitimate um, compliance with the standard. 
Okay, the question was uh, the use of starter cultures and things like that, particularly in, in yogurts and, and dairy, I imagine. Um, the way in which I would answer that would be to look at how you're currently declaring it. Do you declare a starter culture as an ingredient or, or additive? If you're doing that, it's going to be a bit odd when you suddenly claim, no, that's a processing aid in my new label and suddenly say that it's not part of the origin. Um, have a look at your current label and if, you know... If it's not an ingredient on my label. If it's not, already, if it's not an ingredient or additive on your current label, then that means you're currently treating it as a processing aid and this labelling law does not change your characterisation of your ingredients. Whether your, your characterisation is right or wrong is a separate question, but this law doesn't change it. There, there is a big issue, as I said before, about rennet in, in cheese. Some people declare it as an additive, some people declare it as a process. Some people don't declare it because it's a processing aid. OK, let's have a look at the class one, the product of Australia. As I said before, and I can't stress this enough, enough no imported ingredients or additives. You can have imported processing aids to go to that, that question. Significant change, right? The current law allows you to have some small presence ingredients, certainly probably um, additives, and some processing take place overseas. That's gone. Okay? So it's 100% product of Australia, this new law. You're given some choices. It's basically a logo. It's a full bar chart because all of the ingredients and additives are Australian. Yeah. The text options, I think, are they. Grown in Australia, produced in Australia, produce of Australia, product of Australia, Australian grown, Australian produce, Australian product, or insert the name of food, Australian tomatoes. Right. Or you can have made in Australia from Australian ingredients. Even though it's product off, you can have the made in claim. Right? And you can have made in Australia from 100% Australian ingredients. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 options. Choose one. Do not vary. Yep. Yeah. You can't vary that text. That's what you must use. You have options, but you've got to pick one. Okay? So these are the sort of labels that you would look at if you are a product of Australia. However, suppose your product is 100% Australian in terms of its ingredients and uh, additives, and is indeed made here, but you ship it overseas for minor processing. You must declare that overseas processing under this class, right? They don't state what you, how you must declare it. They simply state you must, um, you must indicate the, the processing has taken place overseas, right? But all of their examples actually identify the processing and the country, right? So they're giving an indication of what they expect, even though it's not possibly what the law says. So the example there, grown in Australia, roasted and packed in Singapore. That's the sort of statement that they want. And it must be in brackets. So the question is, if the legal requirement is simply to declare the processing that has taken place overseas, do you reckon you could get away with saying roasted and packed overseas? OK. In my view, that would comply with the legal obligation, but it doesn't comply with the examples that have been given. And this is one of those classic areas where the law says one thing, the enforcers may well have a preference for another thing, and you've got to decide if you want the fight. Right? Is the fight going to be worth it? Right? If you can indicate the processes in the, country, the overseas country and you're not worried about it, just do it. Right? It may not be what the law actually says you have to do, but it's what the regulators are expecting. And why have the fight? Why waste that effort? Right? You've got better things to do with selling your product. Right? The EU is not a country, so you can't have made in the EU or processed in the EU in this case, right? because you must specify the country. Right? But 
you know, as I say, it's a free text statement, so perhaps you could put EU in the, the brackets part of it. Southeast Asia, I don't know. It's an interesting, one of the unresolved issues is, is exactly what this statement might look like. And look, that's it for, for product of. Let me, let me just go back one slide. That, that's basically it. You have a series of text statements. You have 100% logo. You have, sorry, the logo, 100% bar chart a text statement object and a, process, and, and a processing statement if it's processed overseas. That's it for class one. Right? Nothing else to it. Yep, been through this. Okay, made in Australia. When do you use this? When the ingredients have been substantially transformed in Australia, we've talked about the revised test, a change in identity. If you have a fence that is red and you paint it blue, that is not a change in identity. Right? This creates some issues. All right, do we have any coffee roasters here? No. Let me ask a question. Is roasting coffee a substantial transformation? Everyone here says yes. Why? Why? It was, sorry? You can't make coffee from a raw bean. So it, it has different characteristics, right? But has it changed its essential nature? There are some who would say it was a coffee bean when it came in, and it's still a coffee bean now. It has not changed its nature. So substantial transformation is not an easy distinction to always draw. Right? Have a think. The, the message here is to have a think about it, and have a think about it not in terms of the characteristics of the product, but in terms of the nature or identity of the product. Because that's going to be the bigger issue. A question. Would the coffee bean example, the biochemical nature of the bean is changing through roasting. I mean, it's, it's an Yep. So the, the point made is the coffee bean changes its biochemistry when roasting. That's true for any cooking process. It doesn't mean that the thing has changed its identity. Um, a leg of ham is still, is, sorry, a leg of pork is still pork even though it's roast pork. And even though its biochemistry has changed by roasting. So... It, there is no answer, and I don't, I don't want to stand up here and say that roast co you know, a roasted coffee bean is not a substantial transformation from a raw. What I'm saying is I think that is now an open question, whereas previously it perhaps wasn't. And we need to have a think about this when we look at our products to say, are we changing their identity? Most of the time it's obvious. You take flour and water and sugar and a bit of cocoa powder and you make a chocolate cake... Right? That's a substantial transformation, and no one's going to argue the toss. Right? Most of the time it's straightforward, but don't assume it. Right? You really have to ask yourself about changes in essential nature or identity. And where you can put it, the ingredient on one hand and say, that is a coffee bean, and hold the processed things there and say, it's still a coffee bean, that's an issue you're going to have to explore. Reconstitution of juice is not substantial transformation. It's orange juice, admittedly concentrated, and it's still orange juice. That's not a substantial transformation. Yeah? What about fermentation? Uh, the question is whether fermentation is substantial transformation. It depends a little bit on the nature of the product. I would generally say it probably is um, a substantial transformation, which brings you into a made-in type claim. Um, might not help you with your, your bar chart, but, but the front part. But, but really it comes down to not a technical understanding, but a consumer understanding. If you were to go to the consumer and say, here's the tea that I started with and here's the kombucha I ended up with, are they the same thing? If consumers say no, then you've got a substantial transformation. If consumers say, yes, yeah, really, they are, then you've got a problem. So if in doubt in this area, right, it wouldn't hurt to actually go and ask some consumers. Right? Get some evidence to support the decision you are making rather than making it um, off your own judgment or, or off a more technical basis. Because the ACCC doesn't care about the technical... Honestly, the ACCC doesn't care about the biochemistry of it. Right? They're concerned about consumer perceptions or whether consumers see them as the same thing. Question over here. Yeah. The question is, is how strong does your evidence have to be in terms of the numbers of the survey or the quality of the well, survey? Right. Um, 
it, it comes down to the quality of evidence generally, right? So, you know, and, and this is a judgment about how important it is to you. The, if you can show the ACCC you have made a genuine attempt to comply with these laws and you have gone to some effort and maybe got an independent researcher to do the survey and an analysis, then that's better than not having any evidence at all, right? Having a full, independent, double-blind, university-moderated ethics panel-reviewed study is even better. But in origin labelling, probably that's not going to be where you're going to be at, right? So the question is, it is better to, even if it's just a survey of your 10 friends at a barbecue, right, that's better evidence than nothing, right? A proper independent study is even better evidence. And really, you know, it's an area where you can spend as much money or as, and time on as you want, but you've got to make that call as to how important this is for you. But always remember, some evidence is better than no evidence. The question is whether a physical transformation is considered a substantial transformation. Not always, no. No. It depends. It's not so much the, the physicality or appearance or even characteristics. It's the nature of the product that you look at. It's, it's identity. Coffee bean, coffee bean, arguably. Right? Some people would say green coffee bean, roasted coffee bean, and say that they're different. Now, I'm not going to make a call on that. Right? But that's the test, is, and it's, a consumer mind. It's, it's in the consumer's mind, not in a technician's mind. Ground and blended coffee beans? Oh, blends are... A, sorry, the question around, around blends. Blends are a great one. If I take six different salad leaves and put them together into a salad, is that a substantial transformation? Um, that's a classic area where we don't know the answer to that question. Right. The ACCC would probably say that is not a substantial transformation. Okay, please note there is, for made in class two, substantial transformation, there's no requirement that any of the ingredients be Australian. You still get the logo. Right. So if your product is made from 100% imported ingredients, that's fine. Right. Just show an empty bar chart. <laughs> still made in Australia. And as I said, the 50% cost rule is going, so there's no minimum Australian costs. The label mark is as shown here. You have the logo, the partly filled bar chart, and a text statement in a box, unless it's a non-priority food. Okay, the text statement, made in Australia from at least, there's the at least, X percent Australian ingredients. We will come to the average marking later on. Okay. But made in Australia from at least so much percent Australian label. The bar chart is quantized. As I say, you round down your percentage to the nearest 10% mark with extra marks at 5 and 95%. But the text statement is not. So if you have a product that is 68% Australian ingredients, the bar chart is filled to 60%, but your statement is made in Australia from at least 68% Australian ingredients. Right? The text, it has to be a whole number, and you round down to a whole number, right? But you can state the number. It, you don't have to, in the text statement, round it down to the 10%. So for a product that is largely Australian, right, but with maybe a small pro um, additive in there, you're talking probably a bar chart which shows 95%, the logo and a made in Australia from at least 99% Australian ingredients. That's going to be a reasonably common label for products that used to be product of Australia. Okay. What happens if you haven't got much Australian content? There are special rules. If the content is between 1% to 9%, then you can use the statement made in Australia from less than 10%. Right. Gives you a little flaw, whether it's 1, 2, 3, 4 or 9 you can say less than 10. Does that less, less than 10% take you to the 5%? Yes. Uh, well, it's only 1%. well, if, if it's 1%, you get the 5% mark. So you get right? going up. So you, you get to go up in that case. Um, but, oh, sorry, no, strictly speaking, you should round down, sorry. Yeah. So I'll tell a lie. If it's 5 to 9, it's 5. If it's less than that, you're probably showing 0. But you can say less than 10. But you can, but you can say less than 10. 
So the bar chart and the text statement don't have to align. And in fact, this text statement is the more accurate of the two. Okay. Here's some other label marks. If there's no Australian content at all, if it is fully made from imported, you can say made in Australia from 0% Australian ingredients, or you can say made in Australia from imported ingredients. So this is, you know, empty bar chart, you still get the logo. And of course, in, the, in this case, the bar chart shows zero. Again, if there's overseas processing, you must declare it. Bear in mind that the processing, though, cannot be substantial transformation. If it is substantially transformed, even though you might make a product in Australia, but if you send it overseas and it's substantially transformed overseas, it gets made in that country. Right? It's the place of last substantial transformation, if you like, that counts. So you must declare it just like the other one, in brackets. Um, and again, you have all those issues around. The law simply states you must state the overseas processing. All of the examples give the processing and the country in which it takes place. Question. Sorry, the question was, if you get the country wrong for your overseas processing, can you be prosecuted? Yes, you can, because you're not actually complying with the law. Right? What you're doing is actually making a misrepresentation as to the place of the processing. Oops, too low. Okay, another option you're allowed for this class is to identify the origin of a particular ingredient or ingredients. So if you wanted to, even though your product might be made in Australia, but it's got a um, hero ingredient from another country, you can identify that. Right? You use a with statement, and it must start with with, <laughs> Right? And it goes after the brackets if you're putting them together. Right? You can, so the example here is you know, made in Australia from at least X percent ingredients. Know that it's 43% is the ingredient number, but the bar chart shows 40. Right? But you've got your hero ingredient with Brazilian coffee. Right? Or with prawns and peanuts from Thailand. But that's optional. This is entirely optional. You don't, have to do it. don't have to do it at all. May you choose to actually specify one of your ingredients is Australian in that statement? Can, the question is, can you identify it as Australian? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so if you want to. So show that it characterised the ingredient was actually Australian? Yeah, um, and indeed some of the issues where... Um, the, so w one of the driving issues was around ham, right? Made from Australian pork or made from imported pork. Now, obviously that will show up in the bar chart, and in your percentage statement, but you could call it out as a hero statement. So the Australian stuff might be made in Australia. Let's say the, the imported brine is 10%, that sort of number. Your statement might be then made in Australia using Australian pork. It would be from at least, say, 90% Australian ingredients, and you could highlight it with Australian pork if you wanted to. On the other hand, if you particularly like the imported stuff, you could say made in Australia from at least 10, you know, from 0% Australian ingredients with Canadian pork if you wanted to highlight that. Alrighty, the with statement is at the end of the mandated thing. So we, we've gone through those examples. Of course, if you've got a made in Australia that's processed overseas and you do want to indicate um, hero ingredients, you can get a very big label. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. So bear in mind the made in parts mandatory, the overseas processing is mandatory, the hero ingredients is optional. Okay? So if this looks too big from you, your solution is to get rid of your hero ingredient part. Okay, and that's it for made in. And look, by the time we've done product of and made in, we've probably covered most of your product. Right? And what's strange and I'm just looking at the time, is that the ones that we've covered are really quite tightly prescribed. When you looked at product of, it's like you have a choice of 10 statements and you declare processing, and that's all you can have in your box. That's it. It's actually quite simple, right? When you come to made in, right, you've got your logo calculation, you've got the optional with statement, but apart from that, it's fairly straightforward. Oddly, when we come to the imported and the packed in Australia, all of a sudden the options blossom out and you end up with about a million options here, right? 
and it can, you know, I'm going to step through it fairly quickly in the interest of time, but it's, it's interesting, like, the, the less Australian, the more options the government wanted to give you. And that's really, while what, what I'm about to go through may be a bit complicated and covered quickly, it's really about giving people options that they didn't want to give them for the Australian content. They want the Australian content quite tightly regulated. OK, the question is, if I take a product and smoke it using imported wood, uh, does the imported wood... The question is whether you declare wood as an ingredient or additive in your product. It's definitely a flavour. It's definitely a flavour, but... Um, well, actually, the smoke is the flavour rather than the wood. Um, I suspect it probably would be considered a processing aid in that case, but... Um, yeah, it's... I, mean, I think what I like about the question is that it shows you that it's not just as simple as finding a label and slapping it on. You have to really think about how your product is made, what's, what are ingredients, what are additives, what are processing aids, right? what's the Australian content, what can I prove. There's all of this sort of process that needs to go on before you start slapping a label on. Okay, so... When do you get to use class three, the imported? It's when your ingredients are not 100% Australian and where the food is not substantially transformed in Australia. If it's either of those two, you must use one of the higher level marks, yeah? You don't have a choice, right? So if, it is not, if it's not 100% Australian ingredients and additives and it's not substantially transformed in Australia, basic rule, you state the country in which it's made or produced. Right? You don't get a label logo because it's not made here. You don't get a bar chart because... Well, you may get a bar chart. We'll come to that as an option. Right? But your basic statement does not have a bar chart. It is in a box unless it's a non-priority food, in which case it's not in a box, they're made in, origin, uh, made in Austria. And you state the country of origin of the food, made in Thailand, made in Austria, right? or... What happens if the food is made or grown in more than one country? This is where you can state where the food was packed and indicate it's from multiple origins or composed of imported ingredients. Now, packed in could be packed in Australia, right? But it might also be packed overseas. Okay? So again, these are your basic options for imported. And I really want to stress this. These are the basic options, right? A statement of where it's made or produced, a made-in statement, or a multiple origins packed-in statement, or a packed-in from imported ingredient statement, right? This is the keep it simple option. Almost everything that I go on from here is optional. And it can get quite complicated, right? Always remember you can come back to this slide to a simple option. Okay, let's have a look at some of the options. The text statement for the imported mark, grown and produced and product of blah, 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 all the usuals. Uh, and you can also have your packed in and packaged in. Note you can't have bottled in. Right? Bottled in, canned in, all of those other words go. You know, the, new, the new laws only allow packed in or packaged in. Okay. Let's take a look at the example where something is packed in Australia. I'll, I'll, let, me, let me take a step back. These next things are optional. I've said this before, but I just need to keep on saying it. There is a simple option always. Go back to that slide about just having made in country or packed in country from imported ingredients. They're your simple options. You can optionally declare Australian packaging. You can also optionally declare Australian ingredients. And you can optionally declare both Australian packaging and Australian ingredients. OK? But remember the hierarchy. You can't use any of these if your product is actually product of or made in Australia. You must use one of those higher level claims. OK, so if it's imported with 100% ingredients, you can use these labels. Made in the country from 100% Australian ingredients. So you've taken all of your Australian ingredients, shipped them to another country, substantially transformed it in that other country. It's made in that other country, but from 100% Australian ingredients. You can say that. You don't get the logo. It's not made here. 
right? But you do get a 100% bar chart. And if it's packed in Australia, you can actually say this too. It's an optional addition. So it can be made, still have to state the made in the country, still have to state the Australian ingredients, but you can also state that it was packed in Australia. So why you would take your ingredients, ship them to another country to make them there, bring them back and pack them in Australia, I don't know. But if you do, you have your own special label in the information standard. I think, kid you not, this is all, all there in the information standard. OK, if it's not 100%, well, it looks very like the made in, but without the logo. Yeah? Again, you don't get the logo because it's substantially transformed overseas, but you can state the. And it's the same rules. The text statement specifies your actual percentage, the bar chart shows a rounded down. Uh, and if Pacton Australia can state it, da da da. So there's some examples. If there are no Australian ingredients in your imported product, and you want to say that, particularly if you want to say it is packed in Australia, then you have to declare the zero percentage. Right? That's where it's made in one overseas country. Okay? So these are some sort of some sort of options that give you, you know, made, made in, produced in, grown in, product, produce, product of, or name, name of the food. Can you still use a kangaroo logo with that? No, because these are not transformed in Australia. These are not made in. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to have the bar chart. You don't have to, and this is a key point. If you go with a pact in Australia, you have to have the bar chart, oh. right? But if you don't go with pact in, and it's optional, then you just go with your basic keep it simple statement. Right. Right. Okay, you can also highlight ingredients for your imported foods. Right? Australian macadamias, Scottish haggis, cherries from Namibia, whatever. So again, the, this concept of having a hero ingredient is allowed. Right? Fresh produce is fun. I love fresh products. Okay, if you're having selling stuff unpackaged, so fresh, you still need to have your, your label, the box, the bar chart, the text, and, and the logo. And it's in a, basically accompanying um, or displayed in connection with the food. So all of the supermarket delis are, <coughs> excuse me, are going to have to have little signs, right, with the little marking on it. It's a big issue for them. This is my favourite bit of the whole lot. Suppose, though, you've got a big bin of apples, right? And you've just put them in together, and they're from more than one country. Well, here's the thing. If the apples are Australian and imported as a mix, you state mixed origin as your little label. However, if they're all... If it's two different sorts of imported, so if it's Brazilian and Canadian apples, you say multiple origin. Because consumers understand that if it says mixed origin, it means there's some Australian there, whereas if it says multiple origin, it means they're all imported. Apparently consumers understand this fine. Okay, we've talked very quickly about averaging content. Here's how you declare it. Right? Made in Australia, ingredient sources vary you state your average based on your one, two, three year period that's no older than two years, right? And you have to then give a contact statement. It can be a website, it can be a 1-800 number, it can be a barcode, for example, right? And you may need to still declare overseas processing at the end, so it can be quite a big label. And if someone calls these details, you must be able to provide the Australian content of that food. So if you go in for averaging, you are actually buying into a significant data exercise. I hope that's been made clear to you. Not only do you need to have a rolling average to support your statement, you need to keep track of the origin of each batch so that you can answer these queries. Sorry, the question was, can you declare a hero ingredient from a region like a state or territory or even more, more direct than that, um, in, as part of your hero ingredient declaration. The answer is no, hero ingredients are declared by country. 
Okay, um, the, the question is what's the language around those sort of things? Um, the answer is yes, you can, but it's probably better to do that outside the box than inside. Remember, these are just options for inside the box. We'll come in a little bit later to what can you do outside the box. And frankly, I would keep keeping that box as small as I could, hand on heart. I think there are better ways of communicating to consumers those sort of issues about whether it's wild caught or organically harvested or whatever than inside the box. <laughs> what is the origin? Okay, inland fish and uh, coastal fish are, of course, a lot easier. They're the country yeah. in which they're done. Deep sea fish, um, the Australian rule, it is the country of first landing. I kid you not. So you could send a Chinese trawler to the North Atlantic, and if it's first landed at Port Lincoln, then that becomes Australian fish. I am not joking, no. <laughs> OK. However, you know what? Um, I reckon this is one of the areas that's going to need reform. And in the EU and uh, increasingly in the US, there are broad descriptions of fishery zones. There's a North Atlantic fishery and a South Atlantic fishery and a West Pacific and things like that. And uh, the, the tendency is to allow those to be declared as countries. So that would then become product of the North Atlantic or something like that. I think that's a much more sensible way of going than country of first landing, but that's not what we have in Australia at the moment. Mm. All righty. Just a reminder as we wrap up this session, because we're, we're getting late and we've got some morning tea. Believe it or not, I haven't explored every option here. <laughs> if in doubt, look at the information standard, get some external advice, and um, have a look and see if there's a better option for you. Certainly all the major options have been, have been explored but some of the wording, you know, I haven't given an example of every possible wording, particularly where you start to add them together. So, you know, you can imagine that if you have an imported ingredient where you've got a hero ingredient, you're declaring both packed in and um, Australian produce and maybe some overseas processing, you can end up with a box this big, if that's the way you want to go. There is a hierarchy, I've stressed that a lot. Bear in mind that there is usually a simple option. Yeah. This doesn't have to be a complicated exercise. Only complicate it if there is value to you in complicating. Here are ingredients, right? Do you really want to declare them inside the box or do you keep what's in the box simple and declare the hero ingredient outside it? Right? All of those are always options. So think about where the value lies and how you want to communicate. Let's have a look about putting all of this into practice. I'm going to have a look at the data. How do you get data to support the claim that you are going to make? Have a look at how do you make the choices? We've talked about the number of options that you may have for your labelling. What sort of guidance should you have as to which choices you make? How do you manage packaging, particularly up to July 2018? What tools and guides are available? So let's look at keeping you cool. What are the data requirements? The data challenges can be really summed up as collecting, collating, assessing and storing the information. Collecting the data. Who here uses a product information form or a PIF? A few people. All the time. There's a really, really good answer. Um, if you don't already uh, know about the PIF, it is a standard set of information asks for manufacturers to give to their ingredient suppliers to provide all the information that is needed for regulatory compliance. It really is that focus on regulatory compliance. It may not be everything you need to ask. There may be non-regulatory things you are interested in knowing, but the PIF covers the regulatory side. Um, currently, the product information form, it's a product of the Australian Food and Grocery Council, it's going through a little bit of a transition at the moment in that it's moving to an electronic uh, sort of data exchange rather than an Excel spreadsheet, <coughs> but nonetheless it's a good way of doing it. But it's not mandatory, it is simply a, a picture of all of the mandatory asks. 
There is a specific uh, annex in the Excel spreadsheet for country of origin labelling, the reason why I highlight it. Um, <coughs> whether or not you use the PIF, you need to get information from your suppliers about the origin of the foods that they are supplying to you. And that even goes back to Farmgate. It can be as simple as getting a certifi certification that the wheat they are selling you was grown on that farm. Because that's not always the case. There was a very famous issue, I think it was the 1990s, um, where peanut there was uh, peanut contamination with aflatoxins and salmonella. And the uh, products sort of actually went throughout all of the industry. Yeah? King Oroi. Sorry? It was in King, 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 King Oroi was the, the source of it. But people thought they were buying Australian peanuts. <coughs> but in fact, the local peanut association didn't have enough peanuts to supply all of the market all the time. So they were bringing in imported peanut and blending it right, with Australian product and selling it all out as though it were all Australian. So you can't assume that simply because you're buying from an Australian farm even, that it's necessarily Australian product, right? Get your information. You know, one of the biggest rules that I, I need to hear you. Because I'll tell you what, if the ACCC comes knocking on your door and you don't have the data, they're going to explore a lot further. What you want as a food business is when a regulator comes knocking, you can give them all the information they want so that they walk away happy. You don't want them to say, oh, that's a problem. We need to dig further. Okay? So make sure you have a declaration of origin for everything that you get. And the PIF is one way of doing that. It's not the only way. I, I don't want to suggest it's in any way mandatory, but it is um, a standardised form of doing the data collection exercise. Of course, this can also be given to uh, in compound ingredient suppliers for them to use to give to their own ingredient suppliers and so on down the chain. So eventually you've got a full supply chain picture of where your food and ingredients are coming from. Of course, uh, as I've said before, one of the things you may get is the lovely term is lacuna, which is sort of like Greek for gaps, gaps in the information. If you're faced with a gap in your information, treat it as not Australian. You know, it may well be Australian, it may not be, it doesn't matter. If you, can, if you don't <coughs> know and can't prove it, treat it as zero. <coughs> um, you, you, the PIF has questions around organic, but largely um, organic is dealt with by way of certification. So the questions around organic are who has certified you and how current is that certification. So yes, you can trace your organic things. Um, it does GM along similar lines, whether it's identity preserved or, or whatever. Collating the data. <clears throat> okay, if you've got a, a recipe, that will tell you the ingredients and how much you add to make up a batch size of a certain, certain quantity. And this is the calculation you use for your origin. Right? Right. Multiply. Remember, you're really actually only after Australian origin because this is all about calculating your bar chart. To calculate your, your percentage, you simply take the percent, the, the Australianness, if you like, the Australian content of each ingredient, and multiply that by the ratio of that ingredient in the food, and add up that number for all of your ingredients, and there is your Australian content. It's largely a recipe-driven, fairly simple calculation to work it all out. So I guess how do you do it for buys again? Um, is it for in a raw ingredient or in a finished product, the percentage? The percentage is calculated on the basis of ingoing weight. So, and that's a key point that's actually a little different from ingredients lists, right? Volatiles are not excluded from origin. So even though the end product weight is less than the total weight of ingoing ingredients, it's still the weight of ingoing ingredients that is the basis of the origin calculation. Compound ingredients, remember, you have to break down and treat individually. Yeah. The question was, what happens if you put in a dehydrated ingredient? The question is whether there's any moisture also in there that rehydrates it. Right? If there is, then you've got to remember the rules around water. 
right? Because some of the water you add may need to be allocated to rehydrating that concentrated ingredient, in which case it takes on the origin of the ingredient, that proportion. So you almost need to have water brackets to reconstitute the orange juice, close brackets, and then other water. Right, one, is, one takes on the origin of the orange juice, the other one is an ingredient. Uh, yeah, information, if you don't have the information treated as not being Australian, then you won't go wrong. Okay, assessing the data. What's the data quality that you're getting from your suppliers? This is not just a country of origin issue, is it? Right? When you get certification that something is, I don't know, sustainably fished, if you're, you're doing fish, how do you know whether, what's the value of that certificate? Does it come from a reputable agency? When you get a lab report, is it from a NATA lab? Um, you know, we are always assessing the quality of the information we receive in our food businesses. And there are a number of questions. Can I trust it? Will it stay the same? What's its currency? And do I need to audit it? Be prepared for it. Data is going to be king. So when we talk about the data exercise here, treat this seriously. Because you need to spend money to get your data, to analyse it, to make sure you're using it properly in order to make a valid or, or defensible origin mark. Right? And the government really discounted all of that. They assumed you already have all of this information. So this is a big, big exercise. But here's the good news. Treat this as, if you like, the trial run or the, the first off the rank for all of your product information. Because let me tell you, I firmly, firmly believe the issue for food companies in the 21st century will be how well they manage data and how well they are able to provide transparency about their food products to the consumers. Right? This is simply one thing that we have to do that we might as well leverage to make it something worthwhile. And if we can start to get our heads around how can we better inform consumers about the products we are selling them, the more we will have a competitive advantage coming up. So what, this, what does the law not tell you? It doesn't tell you, in the case of products that are substantially transformed in Australia, where all of the ingredients come from. And if you ask consumers, that's actually what they want to know. If you, as a company, are able to provide verifiable or you know, reliable information, maybe not on label, maybe it's on a website, maybe it's through a QR code, if you are able to communicate this stuff transparently to your consumers, they will trust your brand. And if you are worried about the, the duopoly and the growth of home brands in supermarkets and things like that in, in Australia, the answer is, lies in the power of the brand. And the, one of the best ways you can introduce brand value is to get consumer trust. And consumer trust will come in food, the food space through better transparency. And that's why I think information is, is going to be one of those touchstone issues for us for the 21st century. Big picture stuff. Bring it back to origin labelling. Can you get better origin labelling information not just so that you can comply with the obligation, but so you can start to build a transparency initiative to consumers that will build your brand value. That's the challenge I'd like to leave you with. <coughs> <It's, coughs> excuse me. To do that, you need to make sure your information is reliable. But above all, <coughs> continuity and currency are key issues. Excuse me. <coughs> Someone was <coughs> commenting to me in the, the break about the number of recalls this year. Has anyone followed that? The first three months of this year have been horrendous for recalls, particularly allergen-related recalls. And one of the reasons for that is people aren't keeping their data up to date. What they might have got through a product information form, say, for the ingredient six months ago, what can happen is that the product can get changed and all of a sudden an allergen can get introduced. It's in the current version of the product information form, but not the one that you got six months ago. 
So you're continuing to manufacture an order based on this product, but you don't know that the information has changed underneath you, so you don't know that you need to relabel. Right? How do you ensure the information you, are, you get is current, and what's its continuity? It will remain current for how long? These are this is all information which you need to manage with your ingredient suppliers to make sure you've got the up-to-date information all the time. <coughs> and then there's the issue of verification. Do I need to audit this information? If so, how do I go about auditing it? All right. You may well trust someone you know, to the moon and back. I actually worked when I, uh, as a private practice lawyer uh, for a client who was a uh, part of a bigger multinational family business selling um, what they thought were a certain were candle nuts there at a tree nut. Um, and it turns out that all of the family worldwide that were importing these candle nuts from a, a, a particular grower in, um, overseas um, were being misled. And in fact, what was being sold was a very, very poisonous nut. <laughs> Um, that could kill people if they overconsumed it. Um, these people trusted their uncle. Right? It was family business, but they were misled. Right? And the potential there was, uh, you know, they, they, they were actually dealing with potential fatalities. So you, don't, you want to make sure that the, you get information from sources that you can demonstrate are trustworthy, not just whom you trust. Can you see the, the distinction there? It's not about you. It's about if the ACCC came knocking on my door, would the ACCC trust this information as much as I do or not? Question. The question is about how, how far back to the chain and, and where does the buck stop where, uh, when you're looking at uh, product uh, information validity? The answer is the buck will always stop with the person whose name's on the label. Right, that's the one who carries legal responsibility for it. Um, if you, whether or not, you know, in terms of product liability, that's going to come home to you if your name's on the label, even if it's someone else's fault because it's your name on the label. Okay, the question in terms of, you know, criminal liability for breaches of the Food Sands Code or indeed of this this origin labelling is a little bit more complex, in that there is generally a, it depends on how the prosecution. <coughs> phrases its case. Um, sometimes reasonable reliance on third party information is a defence, in which case the question really comes in how reasonable was your reliance. To a degree that's did you have any reason not to believe it, <laughs> right? Partly it's based on what, in, what steps have you taken to verify it. Like all such things there's scale, so I've done nothing, I just believed it implicitly is at one end of the scale to I've fully independently audited it and I know it's true is at the other end of the scale and there's a whole lot in between, right? I'd suggest you do a bit of a risk analysis of your food and focus your attention on the ones that are likely to be the biggest risk, right? And that will depend on, on the nature of your business, right? But ultimately the buck stopping with the person whose name's on the food and how far down you go depends on the nature of the ingredients and the relationship you have. And yeah, it, it can be contractual. Sorry, Aaron, you had a question. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay, the, I, I think this goes back to the discussion we had on transparency. What about things like child labour, uh, carbon footprint, all of the other issues? Uh, even halal labelling is, you know, some people want it to know whether they can eat it, other people want to know if, so they can avoid it. Um, the answer is, of course, most of those things are not mandatory, legally regulated things. Um, but nonetheless, one of the... I think you're right to say that the transparency issue initiative, um, a lot of them that have been done to date finish where the label finishes. Right? So we will make the information that's on the label also available online. But if you're in a supermarket, why would you look up a QR code to go online to the same information that's on the label before you? That doesn't make sense. Right? So I think the point you make is right, is that a true extended labelling issue has got to start where the label finishes and start getting into all of these other issues. The question is, what's important to the consumers of your product? Are they interested in child labour, or are they interested in halal status, or are they interested in carbon footprint? And that's where it pays you to know your consumers well. 
right? And the more, you know, you don't have to do everything straight away, right? But if you can deliver con to consumers the sort of information they're looking for sooner rather than later, you will reap the reward of that. So did you have a question, David, as well? Or? No. Uh, yeah. um, for your authenticity and verification of some products, would uh, like a NATA logo on the product? NATA's about testing, yeah. Yeah, put people's minds at ease. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say so because most consumers wouldn't know what that means, yeah. right? But the regulators do. And, like, um, and so if you have a NATA analyses, a NATA lab do your analyses, that's obviously a lot better in terms of regulators are going to look at that and they will take that as being right. Um, as distinct from, uh, here's a lab report, but it's not NATA, that would be given less weight. Storing the data. Um, bear in mind that the records you need to keep for compliance will be three years from the end of the shelf life of the product. Okay. This is the time in which the ACCC can actually prosecute you for a contravention of the labelling standard. So you need to keep your records available in case the ACCC comes knocking. Um, you'll remember that there's a certain group of things that you do not need to label your product, but you need to provide information. Where you're selling a product that is then going to be unsold by your customer, or where your customer is going to use it as an ingredient in another food. You must provide country of origin information. Surprisingly, you're only required to keep those records for one year. I don't know why that's written into the information standard, but it is. Um, and uh, I, I think they simply hadn't understood the, the general three-year requirement that's in the, the ACL, the, the Australian Consumer Law. But anyway, there is a difference between the two, and, and there it is. Losing your cool. How, how do you approach all of this issue? Right? How do you keep calm when you're faced with all of your labels needing origin statements by the 1st of July this year? First question, is it a non-priority food? If it's a non-priority food, right, all I have to do is have a tech statement about is it made, produced in Australia, say it. Right? Uh, if it's packed in Australia, say that, or else state where it's from. Right? Largely, probably what you're already doing for your product. It doesn't have to be in a box. Nothing else, just tech statement. So if it's a non-priority food, that's your first, first answer. The poor ice cream lady. Remember always to check the dictionary at the back of the information standard. That's what the poor ice cream lady had failed to do and had wasted a lot of time and effort. It doesn't mean no labelling. As I said, you still require labelling, it's just you're not involved in boxes and logos and bar charts and all of those sort of things. The next thing to ask is, what's my actual obligation? Where do I sit in the hierarchy list? Am I a product of? Am I made in? Am I imported? And if I'm imported, do I want to declare Australian packaging and or do I want to declare Australian content? Where do I sit in the hierarchy? And that's both labelling as well as point of sale. So, if I'm selling stuff and it's going into a fresh deli in a supermarket, they're going to want the information to be able to, um, to label it at point of sale. Yeah, there, there, there is this hierarchy, isn't there? Product that's in retail packaging requires labelling. Stuff that's for retail sale but unpackaged requires a point of sale display. Other cases, you have to provide the information. If you're in the labelling, what? Declaration must I make? What wording options do I have? You've seen that there are a lot of options there, right? And I think a lot of people are just going to go for product of and made in. But for Pete's sake, the government's given you choices. Have a serious think about what works best for your product. Have a look at those options. Would it be better to say produce of? Would it be better to say Australian macadamias than product of Australia? Right? You have the options. Think about them. Don't just go with the easy one, if you like. Do I want to highlight an ingredient? Do I want to use a with Australian macadamias, with Brazilian coffee, with Italian olives? Right? Do I want to use that option? I don't have to, but I can if I want. And of course, the big questions for labelling. Do I use minimum or do I use average? Minimum 
may result in serious under-declaring Australian content. Right? We had that example where something was 75% Australian content for three quarters of the year, but for the other part, it was all imported, and the Australian content is zero. The minimum content is zero, even though there's significant Australian content. And that's, that's the outcome of this standard. It is minimum labelling as the, the default option. Does that worry you? If it worries you, do I, can I go for average content? Do I have the data to support an averaging claim? Right. Which of those labelling options am I going to choose? And particularly if I'm going for minimum, but it works for both, what is the content that I can guarantee? Not just what's my usual, normal, right, every day. Right. It's not just talking about availability in a normal year. It's talking about predictability of cyclones, of fires, of floods. All of those things that we know are going to happen and if we grow rice in the Riverina, they do have times of drought and the rice crop there goes down. And so what am I going to declare as my minimum content based on Riverina rice? Do I assume that there may be times when I'll need to import it, in which case I count it as zero? Right? What percentage can I guarantee? That is a key question. And what evidence do I have for it? How can I prove that number if the ACCC comes knocking? Alrighty, label change management. Implementation date 1 July 2018. Ongoing stock in, change, stock in trade, which means that if you package something prior to 1 July 2018, you can continue to sell it through. How much label stock do you have at the moment? Can you use it all by the first well, the 30th of June. If the answer to that is no, you're going to have to look at tossing some label stock out or re over stickering it. Right? Perhaps now's the time to be thinking of this. Right? Because I tell you, the, I, I wish I'd taken my own advice. When this came out two years ago, I thought, you know what I should do? I should buy shares in printing companies. <laughs> because everyone in Australia is going to have to change their labels in the next two years, and there's going to be a big rush come the first half of 2018. I didn't do that, but I think label shares in, uh, sorry, shares in, in labelling companies have gone through the roof lately. Um, bear in mind that you may need to compete for that, like that printing resource. Right? You may need to look at overseas printing. You need to think about how you're going to manage this change if you haven't already done so. And indeed, if you don't have a plan for using your new labels and getting the, getting the new labeling, using your old labels, sorry, and getting your new labels in place, that's probably the thing you should do this afternoon. Right? Is write that plan. How are we going to use our existing label stock? Are we going to overstick it? In which case where are we going to get the stickers printed? How are we going to apply them? Right? Or are we going to have new labels in place? How are we going to guarantee that on the 30th of June the old stock get to gets tossed and not used? Right? What's our process to get this in place? Now, I can't give you that. It's going to depend on your own internal processes. Right? But have the plan in place. You don't want to be doing this on the fly because that's how mistakes happen. We say the start date is 1 July 2018. Is it? Well, legally, that's the date. But what would you do if your customer says, I'm not interested in this stock and trade thing. I want new labels as from the start of May. What are you going to do? You have the choice. You can say, well, I'm not going to sell to you because my labels are perfectly legal and yeah, that's the way I'm going to do. But what happens if that customer is one of the two major supermarkets? Right? You need to know your customer's expectations and manage the customer expectations as part of this exercise. It doesn't hurt to tell them, once you have your label change plan in place, it doesn't hurt to share that with your customers so that they know what you are doing. I mean, I, number one, they'll be reassured you know what you're doing because... You know, they know that this is coming, so they'd be reassured that you are up on it and have a plan to deal with it. 
but it also helps manage their expectations as to what stock they will be getting when. Because they're worried. Let me tell you, the supermarkets are hugely worried about this as an exercise. Right? They're, they're potentially liable if they sell non-compliant stock. So they're going to need assurance that your, the stock you give to them is compliant, especially as from 1 July. Giving them a, an implementation plan can help minimise that risk and give them the assurance that you're not the one they need to worry about. Think about the commercial news. Because 1 July is like really soon. We're going to be there very, very quickly. I've covered a lot of these. Have you advised your customers? Overseas, I should have mentioned this. If you export, the moment you start selling them a product with a different label, they freak. Right? And what's more, the government <laughs> import inspection people freak. Right? Because it's different and they think that the thing's changed. So label management and in particular keeping people informed of what you're doing and when is actually a key thing. Right? And it wouldn't hurt to tell if you do have overseas customers that just so you know, as from the middle of next month, you'll get logo, you know, new product with a logo on it, and I'll come to use of the logos in export markets in a sec. Um, just be prepared for that, and all it means is that the law here has changed its labelling. It doesn't. We haven't changed the formulation. We haven't done anything else. They need that reassurance. The other, well, an interesting point is that this is also an opportunity, if you haven't already done it, to review and renew your labels and to make any other changes that need to be made. Do you have the horrible AL letters in your nutrition information panel? Now's the time to take it off. Did you know that in 2015, the law around NIPs changed? Who knew that? Some people. The, the law used to say a table to the effect, which means that you could vary the layout of the table. It now says a table in the form, which means that you need NIPs in the form that they are set out in the food standards column. The, okay, the two columns, you know, even things like having serving size and serves for the pack on separate lines, all of those are now becoming important. So this is the opportunity to do something good. Very quickly, what help is out there? The ACCC compliance guide. There's a style guide, cool tool, and an artwork library. There's a website. I think these slides will be available on request from Patricia if you want to call her later. The ACCC guide is 38 pages. I mean, the information standard's about 38 pages, so it's not going to tell you a lot. Don't expect all of your questions to be answered in there. And in particular, the ACCC guide tells how they think it should work, not necessarily what the law says. Right? Right. The line might be here according to the language, but the ACCC draws the line there. Always be aware. And they're, they're pretty clean about it. They will say the ACCC's view is dot, 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 dot. So you know that that's not what the law says is. It's what the ACCC believes. It doesn't mean that you, could, you should ignore it. It's always good to know what the regulators think right? and comply with it if you can. But always be aware of that distinction between a legal requirement and an ACCC view. There is a style guide. I talked about there being no minimum size and things like that. However, there is a style guide. And the style, it's not law, but it specifies colours for green and gold. It specifies the font used for the text statement, which is interstate bold, if you are interested. It suggests that there be a three millimetre separation around the outside of the green box. Who's got that amount of space on their label left? I don't know. It talks about where it should be placed. In particular, don't stick it on the bottom, please. Apart from that, they're not too worried. <laughs> because it then talks about size. So the, the guide is just a guide, but it can be a useful thing. It's like all regulatory things. If you can comply with it, why, why not? The cool tool is an interesting one. This is an online site on the access through the business.gov.au site. You key in your product data, and it will spit out for you the relevant mark that you can then just download and copy and paste into your artwork. So it actually is quite a useful tool and indeed all of the marks that you've seen in my presentation this morning have been generated using the cool tool. So it can be, you know, it's very flexible, it can get you to the end thing. I'm a computer person as well in my spare time, GIGO is a thing for us, garbage in, garbage out, right? It takes your data. 
Right? The fact that it's generated by a government tool, it's not going to be any defence if the ACCC comes knocking and says it's wrong because it's based on the data you put in. And if you put in the wrong data, it'll give you the wrong mark. Yeah. No, that basically you're, you're constricted to a portrait or a landscape view of it. Yeah. And so the, if, and the, if it's going to be that long, it's going to be that long. If it's going to be that long, it's going to be that long. No. Yeah. Okay, recommends standard marks, generates the standard mark and downloads them. As I said, all of the marks here have been taken from that. There's an artwork library that's available, so if you don't want to use the cool tool, if you want to make up your own, you can download each of the elements, including the logo and the various bar charts. Uh, from the website. Is there a minimum size, Chris? Uh, not in law. The, um, the style guide makes recommendations, but they're, but they're not law. Um, I've seen the mock-up for, I think it was like a packet of Tic Tacs, and it was pretty small. The question is, it's got to be legible. Okay, what are the issues? Can you use this for non-foods? Well, the issue is around the logo, right? The short answer is the government has no problems with you using the same origin labelling system for non-foods, but in areas other than domestic food, the logo is actually the licensed intellectual property of the Australian Made Australian Grown campaign. So what you need to do is get a licence from AMAG to use the Kangaroo and Triangle logo for your non-food product. And if you get that licence, you will then be able to use the origin mark. So it's not quite as simple as for food. Um, and similarly for export markets, the law, the law essentially gives you a licence to use the Kangaroo and Triangle logo for food that is labelled for the domestic market. If you use that same label for your export markets, then that licence will also cover you. So if you use the same label for domestic and export, then you don't need to do anything. If you use a different label for your export market, you will need to get a licence from AMAG for the, for the same mark. Yep. If you don't want to get the licence, you, you simply don't have it. And you maybe put the export only. Remember we covered that earlier? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that would be the safest rule if you don't want to pay for a licence. Or else use your domestic label. Yeah. What happens if your food is from multiple origins? Well, remember that in a number of cases, the information standard allows that. It, you know, there are so, you know, if it comes from one country, you state it. If it comes from more than one country, for example, in the imported foods packed in, uh, then you can say packed in country from multiple origins or from imported foods. There is case law that says that, I mean, let's take something like an orange juice, that you are blending from a mix of Australian and Brazilian concentrate. Right? Um, the Australian juice is all Australian. The Brazilian juice is um, Brazilian, including the water used to reconstitute it, even if that water was Australian, it becomes Brazilian when you use it to reconstitute Brazilian juice. You blend the two together. Well, both of them were orange juice, and they're still orange juice, so there's no substantial transformation. So it's not made in. It's, sort of, it's not all Australian, so product of Australia is a difficult one. How do you describe the origin of this product? It's not all imported either. Sorry? Well, that's the, it, one of the answers from the information standard is you could go packed, packed in Australia from multiple origins. Right? Um, and you could even then go down the packed in Australia from multiple origins with a little bar chart to show the, the Australian juice content. Right? They're the sort of options. How about this? Can you say product of Australia and Brazil? It's an interesting one. The federal court said yes. Way, way back, the federal court said yes. Not on this standard, but on a separate case where they looked at the claim that was made. So the, they had this product, and they called it Product of Australia, which clearly wasn't because it had imported Brazilian concentrate. And the court said that in that case that this juice was Product of Australia and Brazil. So what I, I suppose what I'd say is if there is a mark that sits in the information standard that we've talked about this morning, use it. 
But if you've got a really complicated origin, get some advice about it because it may be possible to state multiple origins for your food in a way that complies with the information standard. Origin can be a really tricky thing, particularly where you use commodity products that are blends of whatever's cheap from around the world. Okay? So there may be ways around it, is all I'm saying on that one. Other on-packed representations and off-packed representations, there is nothing in the information standard which says you can't talk about origin elsewhere. If you do, it is simply subject to the normal consumer law provisions about being false and misleading. So if you want to talk about regionality, right, if, you want to talk, if you want to talk about a hero ingredient, you don't have to do it inside the box. You can do it outside the box. Right, just don't be false and misleading. This is a key, key point. Hand on heart, if I give recommendations about origin labelling to people, I'd say, in the box, keep it simple. Use the shortest one you can, right? because there is nothing in the optional bits that you can't say or anyway outside the box, and outside the box it's not regulated except by the law of, against false and misleading. If you go inside the box, there's all those rules that you have to jump through about the language you use and that sort of thing. Right? Get the freedom. Go outside the box. Keep the, what's in the box simple. Go for your outside the box re representations. The law allows that, subject to the general rule that thou shalt not be false or misleading. Uh, data, can you prove the claim? We've done that. Be very, very sure of your sourcing. Right. Don't fear under-declaring. There's going to be a lot of products out there that are made in Australia from 0% Australian ingredients. Right. That's the reality of the Australian market. Be conscious of what I call the made-in squeeze. Made-in is expanding, product will be shrinking, and packaging is shrinking. Right. Made-in is expanding. That's normal. That's happening to everyone. If you're in the affected categories, don't fret about it. Everyone else is in the same boat. Water is tricky, remember the three rules and treat them with respect. And bear in mind your implementation date. 1 July is the regulated date. Talk to your customers, get your plans in place. Let's have a look at general questions. Come, yeah. General questions. OK, so I've got it on water and reconstitution. So I'm looking at the guide. Uh, it talks about fruit juice, um, concentrate, uh, it's out of water, it's become, the water becomes foreign. Um, but it has dry batter mix and it has dry pasta. And it's basically saying because pasta is unedible in its original form, if you were to rehydrate it, the water stays from its origin country. Does the same apply for tea, where you would never eat raw tea leaves? <laughs> yes. Right? Well, that's the interesting. What's the, what's the food? Is it tea or tea leaves? Yeah. Um, this is the ACCC guide. This is the ACCC yeah. guide. No. Okay. Bear yeah. what in mind I said about the ACCC guide. Uh, it's better to read the law. Yeah. the ACCC guide, sure. right? Um, I think there are many concentrated foods that are inedible. Right? The test is whether the food is dehydrated and concentrated and is then rehydrated. Right. Not whether it's edible or inedible in the concentrated form. So that's probably an area where I would say you take the ACCC guide with a grain of salt. Okay, take the law as meaning. The law is what you must need. Because two of the three examples lean towards being able to use your water as the origin. The second yeah. example is a dry batter premix, so where you have sugar. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I should answer your question more directly too. The question was about um, is tea a sort of a dehydrated ingredient that gets reconstituted? Yes. I don't think it is. Right? Okay. So even though the tea leaves are indeed dried, yeah. you are not reconstituting them and then eating the reconstituted product. Right? right? The water in a tea, I would say, is an ingredient. Okay, and so that's the ingredient is where it comes from. So if you use Australian water, it's Australian. Excellent. Now, I have a second question, which is to say that a product... A hypothetical, please. Hypothetical. <laughs> so um, a kombucha would, uh, could potentially sit in the non-priority category because is it considered a uh, soft drink? Yes. Or a sports drink? Or a carbonated drink? Or an alcoholic drink? Because kombucha sits in, um, for it to be, you have a certain Western Australia has to fall below 1.15% alcohol. And the non-priority food for an alcoholic beverage is, over, is any beverage, any beverage over 0.5%. 0 0.5, 0 .5, correct. So then that That's the difference between licensing laws and food standards code. Right. Yeah. So but then does that make my beverage a non-priority food because over 0 
It's over 0.5, then yeah, it's an alcoholic beverage. 1.15. Yeah. So it's okay, the answer is have a look. Have a look at the. Have a look at that dictionary at the back of the, uh, the information standard, yes. right? And follow through the definitions. By and large, if things are not separately defined, yes. the definitions that exist in the Food Standards Code are carried over. Okay, so as so long as there's not an exclusion, a non-lead. That's the idea. So, so take a look at your dictionary to get your answer there. Okay, great. I've got three definitions. Up the back. So that means now on our label, we can legally use the term 100%. Uh, yes, in, for products that are 100%, say, Australian, yep. you can. Yep. Certainly under the information standard, um, for a product that is indeed 100% Australian, yep. you are allowed to state, and in fact, one of the options requires you to state 100%, yep. And you have the safe harbour, which says that, by definition, is also not false and misleading to say that. 100% uh, natural, again, gets into ACCC territory. There is a thing, if, you, if you're interested in claims about natural or about um, pure or those sort of things, the ACCC has a thing called the Food Descriptors Guideline, which talks about how they interpret natural. If all of your product meets that definition in the ACCC guide, then there's nothing wrong with saying 100% natural. Yeah. Primary packaging is excluded from this law, right? Uh, this law applies to the retail packs, not to... The original primary packaging is out. Well, it depends what you mean. I, I, I hear people using those terms in different ways. Certainly, the way I would, would put it is, as I've stated, the pack that is intended for sale to, re, to consumers which may or may not be out of packs as well. So, you know, you've know, got to think about how you're selling your product. You know, there, there are individual packs that may be in multi-packs. Multi-packs can be in boxes. Boxes can be in containers. The question is which out of those are for sale to consumers and different, so different uh, customers of yours may sell different layers. Right? There are some that will sell it by the box. There will some that sell by the multi-pack. There will some that break open the multi-packs and sell in us. Right, so you've got to think about how your product is sold and marked accordingly. I'll give you half a so it's a food and hundred percent Australian ingredient mm -hmm. packed in a recycle packaging. Can it can it have a label Australian product? Uh, the packaging doesn't count; it's the ingredients. But if the answer is that that's one hundred percent Australian, then that's what must be on the label. Smaller packaging. Consumer packs. Okay, the question is about the taking uh, large bulk packs of a product and repackaging it into consumer packs. The person selling you the bulk pack, if that's not a retail pack, does not have to label their pack, the, the big one, mm -hmm. with origin, but they need to provide you with the information. Okay. Right? You then are responsible for when you repack into the consumer packs, have to have the full 11 including country of origin labelling, on your retail pack. Would it be acceptable to have that information available upon request but not have it? Because I think that might be what's currently... Okay, the question is, is whether that information actually has to... the retail pack has to be information or available on request. That comes down to that list of exclusions and the general food standards law um, around whether packages need to be labelled or not. Generally, stuff that is for retail sale will need full labelling. No. Um, the question is actually a specific one around ice cream and the fact whether it gets labelled by weight or volume. Um, if it's labelled by volume, you have the opportunity to blend in more air and get a bigger volume from essentially the same weight. Um, and this has been the, the subject of trade wars between ourselves and New Zealand for decades. Um, so no, origin labelling does not has had no effect on trade measurement legislation. So this doesn't change it, other than you can end up with the odd thing about whether is air an ingredient in your product, <laughs> right, and in which case is that air Australian or not and do you count it? <laughs> Bearing in mind that it's done by ingoing weight, I suspect it probably doesn't change the calculation very much. <laughs> but, but the key thing is that the origin calculation is by ingoing ingredient weight, not, not volume or anything else. Even for the production of drinks, it's in going weight. 
Sorry, you had a question. Yeah. Sorry, uh, if we were to import a product uh, specifically for the food service sector, which doesn't require the full labeling of the rest of it. Correct. Say uh, we then unsold the product and then the next person unsold that product and it somehow ended up at consumer level, who is responsible for, uh, or who, who can be held responsible? Because obviously at the end of the day, it would be the company's name that's on that bag, yep. uh, would it come back to... Initially it would come back to you. Yep. I think the issue will be for you then to prove from your own contracts and records that you did not sell that for retail or for on sale to retail. Yep. And then the person who broke that chain would, out, would carry the responsibility. Yep. Okay. The, the real issue there is going to depend on substantial transformation. Yeah. So the, the example, was, um, the question relates to Australian ingredients being sent overseas, transformed there into an intermediate product, that intermediate product coming back to Australia, further processing here in Australia, what's the labelling? Yeah, that's the question. So the, the answer is if the final process is production in Australia, then that is still made in Australia if it's substantially transformed here. Using that intermediate ingredient maybe with other things, if it's then substantially transformed, that becomes Australian. If not, then it's an imported product. Right? The Australian content is a separate question. If it's made in Australia, you must declare Australian content. And the fact that Australian content went overseas for processing right, then becomes a brackets processing bit <laughs> rather than it doesn't change the fact that it's Australian ingredients and that gets declared in the bar chart. So in the first example where the intermediate product comes back and is substantially formed in Australia, transformed in Australia, that would be made in Australia from X percent Australian ingredients and that X percent would include the stuff that went overseas. Brackets indicate the processing that took place overseas, close brackets. So that's that example. If the intermediate product came back to Australia and is not substantially transformed, then that's made in that other country. As an imported product, keep it simple, just say made in Indonesia or wherever. Um, and you know, if you wanted to, you could make a claim about Australian content that could go in the box, but it could also go outside the box and you might have greater freedom by making the claim outside the box. So it, it really, the, the key issue for you is does the product that comes back get substantially transformed or not? It is whether the incoming ingredients are different in nature or essence to the end product. And that's a consumer judgment more than anything else. So, like I say, if in doubt, get some research. Alrighty, I think we've come to the end of our time, so I'll hand back. I'll just very quickly check. Um, I don't, we haven't had any questions from the regions. I'm not sure if any of the regions are still with us, but were there any... Any questions from any of the regions? No questions from Albany, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Northam. How does it affect farmers' market situations? Um, fresh product may come in loose or it may also come in packaged. Yeah, look, great question. Uh, if it comes in packaged, then you're required a mark on that package because this applies... Essentially, farmers' markets are still a retail outlet, Yeah. So anything that's packaged, if it's sold in a farmer's market, requires the same as a retail label as if it was sold in a supermarket. If it comes unpackaged, that's like being sold in the supermarket. You will need a little tag that indicates the... Um, that, ha that has the standard mark on it for that product. Or you also then get into the opportunity to maybe sell multiple origins in the one box, uh, in which case you end up with that mixed origin and multiple origin disaster, in my view. But... Um, but the long and short of it is farmers' markets are, are treated as the same as supermarkets in terms of compliance, so everything there will pretty much need to be labelled either on label or in market uh, point of sale material that accompanies it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, so really now it's just uh, 
thank you to Chris for, for coming across and, um, and uh, presenting to you. I often feel that a measure of the value of these, these forums is the amount of question and feedback that, that occurs from the audience. And uh, you know, I have to say, Chris, that today is probably you know, within the top 10 percentile of, okay. of the, the amount of questions that we've had from the audience, but also your ability to respond to those questions has been exemplary. But look, if you could all join me in thanking Chris for, for his uh, time and presentation today. Thank you.